Αγαπητές φίλες και φίλοι, καλησπέρα σας. Είναι η πρώτη μας συνάντηση για το 2021 και πριν προχωρήσουμε στην παρουσίαση των καλεσμένων μας και των θεμάτων που θα συζητήσουμε σήμερα, θα ήθελα να ευχηθώ στον καθέναν από εσά και στην κάθε μία ένα ευτυχισμένο και δημιουργικό 2021 γεμάτο με υγεία και αισιοδοξία. Θα αναζητήσουμε σήμερα τη γνώση και την εμπειρία δύο διακεκριμένων επιστημόνων. Θα μιλήσουμε για τις απειλές και τις προκλήσεις της ασφάλειας στο παγκόσμιο πεδίο, καθώς και για το διεθνές δίκαιο και τη σχέση του με την εθνική ασφάλεια κάθε χώρας, αλλά πιο συγκεκριμένα για τη χώρα μας στην Ελλάδα. Το πρώτο μέρος θα καλύψει ο αναλυτής γεωστρατηγικών θεμάτων, ο κ. Τζον Σιτιλίδης, από την ΟΑΣΥΚΝΟ των Ηνωμένων Πολιτιών. Και στο δεύτερο μέρος θα αναπτυχθεί από τον κύριο Μίλτο Σαριγιανίδη, καθηγητή του Δημοσίου Διεθνούς Δικαίου της Νομικής Σχολής του, Πανεπιστη... του Αριστοτελείου Πανεπιστημίου Θεσσαλονίκης. Και μέσα μετά από τα εισαγωγικά αυτά, θα ήθελα να αναφερθώ σε μια ιδιαιτερότητα για, τη σημερινή, για το σημερινό μας πρόγραμμα. Η συζήτηση σήμερα θα γίνει στην αγγλική γλώσσα. Ο πρώτος λόγος είναι ότι... Θέλουμε να διευκολύνουμε τον καλεσμένο μας από την Ουάσικτον, που παρότι τα ελληνικά του είναι επαρκέστατα και μπορεί να το κάνει και στα ελληνικά, θέλουμε να του δίνουμε την ευκαιρία να μιλήσει στα αγγλικά, στη γλώσσα που χρησιμοποιεί καθημερινά και θεωρούμε ότι και εμείς θα κερδίσουμε περισσότερο έχοντας κάποιον να εκφράζεται στη γλώσσα της καθημερινότητας. Ο δεύτερος λόγος είναι ότι στην Ελλάδα ζουν πολλοί πολλοί κάτοικοι οι οποίοι δεν μιλούν την ελληνική γλώσσα σε επίπεδο μεγάλης κατανόησης είτε ανήκουν στο διπλωματικό σώμα, είτε ανήκουν σε πολυεθνικές εταιρείες, είτε ανήκουν σε άλλους οργανισμούς. Οπότε θέλουμε να αποκτήσουμε, να δώσουμε τη δυνατότητα και σε αυτούς τους ανθρώπους να παρακολουθούν τα τεκτενόμενα στην Ελλάδα. Σε συνδυασμό με αυτό είναι και το γεγονός ότι ένα μεγάλο μέρος του ελληνικού πληθυσμού ομιλεί πλέον την αγγλική γλώσσα σε πολύ καλό επίπεδο. Το τρίτο είναι ότι στοχεύουμε σε ένα ακροατήριο και εκτός Ελλάδος. Θέλουμε να δημιουργήσουμε μια ομάδα ανθρώπων που να κατανοούν τα ελληνικά θέματα, να κατανοούν τα γεγονότα της ελληνικής πραγματικότητας και να μπορούν να τα χρησιμοποιήσουν, να τα συζητήσουν, να τα αξιολογήσουν και γιατί όχι να μας υποστηρίξουν όπου χρειάζεται στα διεθνή φόρα όπου συζητούνται αυτά τα θέματα. Εσείς ωστόσο μπορείτε να κάνετε τις ερωτήσεις σας και τα σχόλιά σας σε όποια από τις δύο γλώσσες επιθυμείτε. Και τώρα είναι η ώρα για αγγλικά. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I wish every one of you a happy new year. It is a pleasure to be with you tonight in the program Knowledge and Experience that is broadcasted by the Anechnefsis Web TV. I would like to welcome our speakers tonight, which is uh, John Sitilidis, who is going to speak from Washington, DC. John is an expert speaker on geopolitical risk, global affairs and American politics, and also he is a principal at Trilogy Advisors Company. With that last capacity, John is a contractor advisor to the State Department of the United States. So, whatever you are going to hear tonight from him represents his own views and are not necessarily endorsed by the United States government. The second part of our... We ask John to cover issues like threats and challenges in the global security environment, challenges and developments in the Mediterranean, and more specifically, Southeastern Mediterranean Sea, United States, Greece, Defense and Security Cooperation Agreement, and how it might influence the Greek-Turkish relationship. Also, we asked John to, to introduce issues like what the new, the new Biden administration, what mm -hmm. new the Biden administration brings on the relation with Greece, Turkey, European Union, and NATO. The second part, Uh, belongs to, to Professor to Professor Milton Serigenidis, who is, just, as I said before, he teaches uh, inter public international law at the law school of the Aristotle uh, in the University of Thessaloniki. The professor, in addition to teaching, has also published a big number of articles and has delivered uh, many lectures in different forums. He has also been involved in studies on how the international law can resolve issues related with genocides, as well as uh, his uh, in finding alternate ways on solutions on international affairs. Uh, Professor Sarigenidis will cover, let's say, the, what the international law is. He, he, he will going to make us to understand what we're talking about. In general, what someone should understand when he hears the term 
and what he should expect from it. What are the links between international law and the national security system? How is the international law implemented and uh, are the nations obliged to follow it? What happens if not? Is it enough to say that a nation or a state has guaranteed its security, its national security, since it is a member of any of the international organizations? More specifically, what Greece should expect from the United Nations, European Union, NATO, OSCE, as it concerns the relations with Turkey? With that, this uh, longer than normal introduction, I would like to pass the floor to John Sitilidis from Washington, D.C. Good evening, John. How are you? Uh, General Leondadis, uh, good afternoon from Washington, D.C. And uh, let me just slip into my spasta elinica, ya mia stigmi. Na evchitho olus tus o kroates tin elada ke giro ton gozmo chronia pola, kali chronia ke kathe kalo in the new year. Um, thank you very much for accommodating my poor Greek and allowing me to speak here with you and your colleagues and your team in English, because we do have some very difficult and challenging issues to put on the table, General. And it begins with a kaleidoscopic matrix of challenges in Southeastern Europe, in the Eastern Mediterranean, largely because of the historic enmity between Turkey and Greece, that dates back now to about 1955 and the Cyprus issue playing out since the early 1970s over the Aegean issue, since the 1990s with the Grey Jones issues, and now in the last decade in the East Med because of the very valuable natural gas finds in the Eastern Mediterranean, which also draw in now Israel, Egypt, and a number of other countries. So we have a lot to talk about here. I'm looking forward to this conversation, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. So thank you. Let's start with, uh, as uh, I referred earlier, with uh, what the, let's say, what the security in the global environment faces today with. Well, again, it's a very challenging one, and it's one that really is victim, as are many other regions of the world, to the return of geopolitics and of pure power in diplomacy and military affairs and a diminution of the importance of norms, standards, and institutions that had pretty much been in place to secure the regional and global order since the end of World War II. And this was reinforced with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. We had enjoyed relative peace around the world in the 1990s, except, of course, as the people of Greece know, just north of Greece in the Balkans, with a horrific war with a quarter million killed. And then since the uh, early part of the prior decade, with the rise of catastrophic radical Islamic terrorism, the events in Africa, in Europe, and then, of course, in the United States, uh, Spain and the United Kingdom, massive terrorist attacks against innocent civilian populations, and then really transitioning to the world we are in today, General, we, uh, I would trace it to A, uh, activities by Russia in the Caucasus region in 2008, when Russia invaded Georgia uh, under the shadow of the Olympic Games and was able to do so with relative impunity, with very little response from the United States or the European Union for that matter. And then we also had Vladimir Putin making very clear that the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union, revealing his own neo-imperial designs in the Middle East and in Europe. And of course, that culminated with the annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Eastern Ukraine in 2014 and additional frozen conflicts now on Europe's uh, Eastern borders. Mirror this with the rise of China uh, over the last 20 years, largely with the welcoming embrace of the United States and the global West into the World Trade Organization, which the Chinese Communist Party has utterly and ruthlessly exploited to become incredibly rich and powerful over the last 20 years, but not as a responsible member of this global order, but as a power that seeks to upend to replace and to supplant the global West in terms of the institutions that have guided us through peace and prosperity for the last 70 years, and to replace American and European technological and industrial leadership on the world scale. They do so openly, General, in their speeches, in their pronouncements, in their media publications. We in the West have simply ignored all of this until the last several years. 
And now we're dealing with a very dangerous situation where I would posit that the United States and China are in a technological cold war that was launched by China in 2015 with a policy called Made in China 2025 and reinforced now by a new strategy that was announced only six months ago called China Standards 2035. And China intends to have a world-class military that can compete with and potentially defeat that of the United States and its NATO allies and its Asian allies by 2049, the centennial of the rise of the Chinese Communist Party to power in Beijing. So against this larger backdrop, we also see an upending of stability and relative peace and prosperity in the Eastern Mediterranean in the last 10 years, partly due to Russian activities, especially in Syria, and now in the last three to four years in Libya. But I think much of this is also to be placed at the feet of President Erdogan in Turkey, the former prime minister who had led many in the West, including in Greece, in Brussels, and in Washington to believe that he was a genuine reformer. And when he came to power in 2003, that he would move Turkey in a more liberal, more Western, more law-abiding direction, especially from uh, his predecessors in the Kemalist group of political leaders in Ankara. And what we've seen really since he was reelected in 2006, and then especially since the uh, Gezi demonstrations, the Gezi Park demonstrations in 2013, is an increasingly authoritarian approach to his leadership, uh, first as prime minister, now as president, an increasingly majoritarian perspective so that minorities are becoming increasingly marginalized from every perspective, ethnic and religious in uh, Turkey, and also very dangerous for Greece and other neighbors of Turkey in the region, a very adventurous, aggressive, uh, and, and increasingly belligerent and hostile foreign policy and military strategy in the Aegean, in the Black Sea, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And now we see Turkish troops not only occupying Cyprus since 1974, but they are now firmly ensconced in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya. There's now a Turkish base in Somalia. There are Turkish troops in Qatar. And so you see now this neo-Ottoman, neo-imperial design by President Erdogan. And I don't know how much of this is actually sustainable because the Turkish economy is very much on its heels, especially the last three years with the GDP of Turkey in, in absolute decline for the last three years, soaring interest rates, soaring inflation, a collapsing lira, especially relative to the US dollar and other international currencies. So I don't know how sustainable this is, but I'm also very much concerned, and I'll close on this, General, is that I think this is the, the traditional formula of many authoritarian leaders around the world when they're losing support at home. And there are some polls, and here in the United States, we've learned a lot of polls are very unreliable, so let's be <laughs> straightforward here. But in Turkey, some polls show uh, Erdogan with as little, as little as 30% support right now among the Turkish people. And so the concern that I would have if I were in the prime minister's inner circle or the president's inner circle in Nicosia or that of other countries that border Turkey is that President Erdogan will pursue increasingly nationalist foreign policy adventures to distract Turkish voters from the economic woes, from increasing unemployment, from growing food lines and food insecurity in the heartland of Turkey. And so I think we're going to see increasing instability increasing foreign policy drift in Turkey in 2021. And what's going to be the great challenge for the new administration in Washington and really a new administration in the European Union, because yes, the European Union is a largely democratic body with representation by all of its uh, dozen and a half, uh, two dozen and a half members. But if we're frank here from a geopolitical perspective, Germany and France are the main drivers of European Union policy. And we're now going to be entering the post Merkel phase in the European Union with her imminent retirement from German politics in September of 2021. And so we'll have new leadership in Germany, which means a new European Union leadership and the extent to which Washington and Brussels will be able to work together to finally formulate cohesive, coherent strategic approaches to this very difficult problem that is Turkey as a member of NATO, as an erstwhile aspirant to the European Union, but as a country that occupies some of the most critical geopolitical real estate in the world. It's a country that the United States and the European Union have no choice but to deal with 
and they need to be able to do so in a very intelligent, rational, and strategic manner in the year and decade ahead. General? List. And um, uh, I, I, I want to ask this one. We have witnessed somehow that uh, the, the withdrawal, or in other words, the reduction of the United States presence in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And uh, many analysts say that uh, this, let's say, this uh, re reduced presence anyway, gave room to many other forces. And one of them was, let's say, Erdogan and uh, Turkey in order to cover the, to cover the vacuum. And um, uh, how, how do you see the whole, let's say, uh, geopolitical system to go around this perspective? That the, how, Turkey, how Turkey can, uh, let's say, take over the, what the United States left behind in a way? I don't think Turkey will be able to achieve that, but it could seek to attempt to do so in certain areas, especially along its borders. And I'm very, I'm, I'm very glad that you asked that question, General. Let's just put a little bit of sort of American political background to all of this. We had, of course, the very successful initial invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, first because of the 9-11 attacks and then the uh, mistaken belief by American, European and Israeli intelligence agencies that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And so we had the initial successful invasions, but then the fumbled occupations of both countries. And I think the inability of the American military to decisively come out as the victors in both Iraq and Afghanistan have, have caused great damage to the American political system as it pertains to American foreign policy and the use of our military forces so that when President Obama came to power, he had uh, imposed a, a red line in his uh, diplomatic approach to the uh, civil war or civil wars, I should say plural, in Syria in the early part of the prior decade. And then when Syria's uh, leader, uh, Bashir Assad, did use chemical weapons and the Obama administration declined to respond, that left an enormous diplomatic vacuum that first the Russians very skillfully sought to exploit, recognizing that the United States was not going to become involved in another Middle Eastern war the way it already had in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And so we had the pullout of American troops from Iraq, which led to the rise of Islamic State. We had the unwillingness of the United States to get involved in Syria. We had a, a, a terrible situation there. But I think what was very important here in the thinking of the Obama administration is this is not always America's mess to clean up. And the European Union really was the one that was going to be most directly impacted by the collapse of any semblance of civil society inside of Syria and of Iraq because of the rise of Islamic State. And we saw that happen, of course, with the 2015 refugee and migrant crisis that has so roiled and upended domestic uh, politics in various European Union countries. And again, uh, the blame there really has to go to Chancellor Merkel, who unilaterally, with almost zero consultation with any of her European Union partners, announced that Germany was an open house for migrants and refugees to pour in by the hundreds of thousands through Greece, through the Balkan countries. And it's probably the major, major reason why the United Kingdom voted for Brexit in 2016. And under the Trump administration, President Trump, as candidate Trump in 2015 and 2016, stated, as he put it, no more stupid wars in the Middle East. So the American people see that we've put tremendous treasure and blood that's been spilled, American blood, to help bring about stability in other parts of the world. And unfortunately, in retrospect, the mistaken idea that you could bring democracy to a part of the world that is simply incapable institutionally or constitutionally of embracing genuine liberal democracy as we know it in the global West, in Greece, in Europe, and in the United States, anytime in the near future. And so we have this very open vacuum of American, I won't say leadership, because there's still significant American leadership, for instance, in the ability to bring together Israel, the United Arab Emirates, um, and Oman, and uh, Sudan, and Bahrain, to bring about a historic peace deal that Europe has been unable to accomplish, that the Middle Eastern countries themselves were unable to accomplish, that the Trump administration, uh, which was never America alone, it was America first, like any responsible leader, I presume in Greece, Prime Minister Mitsotakis wakes up every day saying, Greece first, not Greece alone, but Greece first. And that's yeah. the responsibility of any leader. So 
Uh, however, having said that, the United States is not in a position to take care of every mess in the world. And unfortunately, this does leave a vacuum for countries like Russia, which has very nefarious ulterior motives. And now it has a permanent long-term, uh, I should say, maybe not permanent, 49-year leases on air and naval facilities in Syria. It's now a major player in the Libya war. And interestingly, Turkey and Russia are fighting each other directly or through proxies in Syria, in Azerbaijan, and in Libya. And Turkey, of course, has a strategic security problem of its own, largely worsened by its own policies. And that is that Erdogan wakes up every day thinking, how do I make sure that the Syrian Kurds are no closer to establishing autonomy or to building an independent nation state in Rojava, in Eastern Syria, anytime in my lifetime, for that matter, then perhaps um, energizing the Northern Iraqi Kurds in Kurdistan and possibly even the Kurds in Iran to be able to foment uh, a civil strife and revolt to form one grand united Kurdistan that encompasses Turkish, Syrian, Iraqi, and Iranian territory. So uh, unfortunately, Turkey has undertaken very misguided policies since the early 1990s, enormously destructive to its domestic Kurdish communities, first in southeastern uh, Turkey, and then in the larger Anatolian heartland, despite the fact that Erdogan had actually reached out to the Kurdish minority through 2013, 2014, 2015, now dubbing them his enemies and engaging in scorched earth uh, domestic political activities, including jailing Kurdish leaders in ways that are very, very problematic for Turkish democracy, however imperfect it may be. So I think we're going to see a situation where Russia and Turkey will be increasingly prominent players in the future of Syria, in Iraq, clearly in Libya. And then let me add one more country into the mix, and that is Turkey's strategic adversary in the Middle East, and that's Iran. And it's very interesting what we're seeing now, General, where in just the last several days, we're hearing intelligence reports about Saudi Arabia and other Sunni countries that, one, have not only ended their boycott of Qatar in the last 24 to 36 hours, but are now possibly in discussions with Turkey at the same time that Erdogan is openly reaching out to Israel and trying to make amends there after 10 years of failed hostility against Israel. And the question is going to be how much of this is directed towards Washington to improve Erdogan's posture with the new Biden administration and with Biden officials that are very close to Israel and to a number of Sunni Arab countries. And also to what extent does Turkey now join with these Sunni Arab countries in the effort to further isolate Iran? And that question is gonna be very important for the incoming administration, which is made very clear. It intends to rejoin the Iran nuclear agreement that President Trump withdrew from in 2017 or 2018 and look to see how it re-engages Iran. So the Middle East is going to be a cauldron likely for several years to come. And Turkey and Russia will do their best to continue to destabilize countries in those regions, pursue their own interests and look to see where they can take advantage of the gap left by the withdrawal of American forces. No, thank you. Although I fully agree with uh, with your view that uh, the Turkey does not cover the vacuum that uh, the let's say the 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 withdrawal of the forces the Middle East has left. But uh, what we see, uh, you refer to the last uh, ten years when uh, the Turkish Israeli relations were not so good, mm -hmm. and uh, we saw that uh, Turkey expanded somehow. Uh, to, the, to its presence in the Middle East with the base, a big base in Qatar. And uh, Qatar has invested a lot of money in Turkey, more or less 50% of the stock market in Turkey belongs to Qatar, mm -hmm. that, that many, many articles say. But uh, what we saw, is, as you said before, uh, what's, what's going on the last 24 hours, we saw Saudi Arabia and Qatar are coming back together. Uh, uh, and uh, do you see any change in this uh, balance that has been established the last 10 years, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain uh, uh, against Qatar and um, the other poll, let's say, is uh, Qatar and Turkey. And of course, uh, do you expect to see any development in uh, the Turkey-Israeli relations that might affect what has happened the last 10 years in the area with the trilateral cooperation like uh, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Cyprus, uh, uh, Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, or all these, you know, uh, formations that are in going, that are 
that are ongoing. And uh, of course, these trilateral have, are going to be expanded to Jordan and later on to Lebanon when the situation uh, comes better. So how do, how do you see all these developments to, to go on the, on, the, on the near future? A very important question that you asked, General. Thank you for raising the concern. Uh, look, what's going to be happening in the Middle East is going to be very consequential for security in the Eastern Mediterranean and for Greece in particular. Let me just offer one uh, geopolitical example, then we'll come back to the specifics of your question about Qatar. Uh, Greece is highly dependent on shipping, uh, both for its own economy, for trade and for commerce, and now with the increasing development of the port of Piraeus. And yet the shipping lanes that connect Greece through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden, the Indian Ocean, and to Asian markets are being increasingly dominated by potentially hostile powers. So in the last five years, we've seen China establish a military base in the tiny country of Djibouti, right at the mouth of the Bab al-Mandab choke point at the southern mouth of the Red Sea. We see that Russia now is looking to establish a military base in Sudan, on Sudan's uh, northeastern coast in the Red Sea. And Turkey, of course, has a training uh, base in Somalia, where it has trained tens of thousands of troops, not only for military training purposes, but it's also teaching all of these Turkish military officers how to speak Turkish. And they're going to be part of a larger, probably Turkish military expansion in the Horn of Africa and in Central Eastern Africa in the years and decades to come. So it's not just the Middle East, but now we're going into Northern Africa and the Horn of Africa and into those vast uh, maritime superhighway trading lanes across the Indian Ocean. And Turkey's looking to play a very important role here. So how Turkey, how Russia, and how China interact in the Red Sea and beyond are all going to have an impact on Greece's economy directly and indirectly. So very important issues for Greece to be mindful of. How Turkey is able to play this issue with Qatar, I think is going to take some time, uh, General, because I don't see uh, Qatar cutting off its financial support for Turkey. And it may be one of the reasons why many of the countries in the region realize that at this date in 2021, their interests align in working more closely together. Turks and Arabs, they're all part of a larger, broader Sunni coalition. And I don't think Turkey is seeking any type of a kinetic military conflict with Iran. But it is interesting to note that now that Turkey is playing a more important kinetic military role in Azerbaijan, to help defeat Armenia with the use of Turkish drones in the uh, brief Azeri-Armenian war. An official Turkish map came out several days ago and was posted on social media that carves out a large uh, Sunni Arab portion of Western Iran, the Khuzestan region, which is marked by tremendous poverty, civil strife, and is where most of Iran's most valuable oil and natural gas fields are located. So the question is, is Turkey now potentially looking to foment Sunni revolt against the Shia leadership of Iran. So very fascinating developments. We're going to be watching very closely. But if I may, General, I'd like to pull the discussion a little bit further west into the area between Greece and Turkey and the Aegean Sea. And the great concern that I have for this new strategic approach that Turkey has been enunciating in recent years called Blue Homeland. And this is where we see now sort of a compilation of Turkey's um, assertions of territorial rights and sovereignty over Greek sovereign waters, airspace, and the like in the Aegean Sea and in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this has all come together now in addition to the gray zones issue ever since the EMEA uh, Kardak crisis of 1996. And now we have Turkey openly asserting that the western, pardon me, the eastern half of the Aegean is essentially Turkish territory in contravention of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and any other international agreements regarding international airspace, international waterways, and the ability of militaries and of maritime vessels to freely navigate through international waters. This is becoming inc increasingly problematic, not only in the Aegean, but also now we see with the EEZ disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean between Crete, Rhodes, and Castellorizo to the west and Cyprus to the east. And this, is the, this has the potential to be a very dangerous area for military escalation between the armed forces of Greece and Turkey, because it's going to be the Greek prime minister's responsibility to protect the sovereignty of every square meter of Greek territory, including in Castellorizo and in Greek territorial waters in the continental shelf off of Castellorizo, Rhodes, and Crete, in precisely the same area where Turkey has declared an unlawful exclusive economic zone connection 
with that of Libya. And so no other country in the region recognizes this exclusive economic zone. I'm sure Miltos will be able to give us much deeper detail into understanding the international interpretations of these actions. But the fact that Greece's EEZ with Egypt literally crisscrosses, right, forms an X with this unlawful Turkish Libya EEZ has the potential to generate a very dangerous flashpoint. And whether it was the Bush, the Clinton, Obama, Trump, and now the Biden administrations, one of the overarching priorities of the United States and our relations with two very important NATO allies, Greece and Turkey, is to do the best that we can to ensure that these two countries' militaries never come into direct conflict. We do not want to see a Greek-Turkish war under any conditions in the East Med, in the Aegean, or by the Everest River. So working with Greece and with Turkey, and very frankly, really more with Turkey, to have the Erdogan government understand that its policies, its directions in recent months, since the summer of 2020, with many of these dangerous military exercises and scientific exploration activities, but also over the years and over the decades, in ways that are very provocative to Greece, do not lend to a, a healthy, robust US, NATO, EU strategy to deal with Turkey and the desire of Turkey, if it's sincere, to become a genuine partner of the West in terms of the European Union and other transatlantic institutions. So Blue Homeland is of great, great concern to me, as are the natural gas claims of uh, Turkey in Cypriot territorial waters in Cyprus's EEZ, and the extent to which I believe, and I'll close on this, General, that Turkey is going to reach out to Israel to see if it can try to wean Israel away from these agreements uh, both in terms of energy and technology, but also in terms of military cooperation and the like, these are very, very valuable for Israel. And Greece and Cyprus serve as very important direct bridges for Israel to the European Union, as well as for bilateral benefits. But Turkey is looking to wean Israel to move away from a pipeline connection that is going to be very difficult to build technically from the Cypriot waters to Crete and route to European destinations and try to convince Israel to instead ignore Cyprus's EEZ and build a pipeline directly to Turkey and connect to Turkey's uh, existing energy grid. I don't believe the Israelis will fall for this at all. They're very smart. This could be a transactional exercise where they look to see where they have particular areas of mutual interest, maybe technology cooperation, maybe trade and tourism and the like. But from a strategic perspective, I think the fact that, for instance, Turkey has been harboring Hamas, which has been funneling money from Iran through Turkey to Hamas to plan anti-Israeli attacks in uh, Gaza, in Israel, and in the Palestinian Authority territory. These are all areas of uh, discord that are going to be very difficult for any Israeli government, any responsible Israeli government, to overlook any time in the near future. So I think the relations will remain raw between Turkey and Israel for quite some time. But just the way the United States is looking for areas of mutual cooperation with Russia, even where Russia is our second greatest adversary after China, uh, I believe Turkey and Israel will look for ways for mutual cooperation where it's beneficial while keeping very mindful, being very mindful of the strategic threat that Turkey continues to pose to Israel because of its policies regarding terrorism, regarding Syria, regarding Iran, and regarding, frankly, the Kurdish situation in Rojava. You, you addressed, well, the first one is uh, the issue of the pipelines, uh, but I will come later to that. But uh, you referred to Africa. Uh, uh, you referred to the what China is doing in Djibouti and uh, what mm -hmm. Turkey is doing in Somalia and Sudan. But uh, at the same time, what we see here in Europe, we see a, a low presence of the United States or a low interest of the United States for Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you know, for, for, for Europe, Africa is the source of refugees, not refugees, of immigrants. Yes. And uh, we have even seen in Greece uh, through Middle East, Somalis and many other countries from Africa to come uh, through Turkey anyway to, mm -hmm. to the Greek islands and then to the mainland of Greece and later on to Europe. So uh, the population in Africa is growing up by, let's say, big numbers. And uh, in, uh, in, let's say, 2050, uh, we expect to see some 50 million more, let's say, in, in, uh, in Africa. That means that the flow of migration will be, let's say, increased. 
how, how do you see the presence or the policy, the United States policy for Africa at this moment? Do you see any change to happen in the future? Uh, I would say you have two very important questions there, General. So let me tackle two of them. First, regarding the United States. Yes, I think it's a very fair comment on U.S. foreign policy that we have tended to marginalize the importance of Africa, especially as so many countries pre-COVID were emerging as some of the most dynamic among the emerging markets around the world. And through 2018, 2019, you could probably find about a dozen African countries that were growing at GDP rates of anywhere from 6 to 8%. Tremendous growth opportunities, especially now with the advent of mobile technology so that African entrepreneurs and business leaders don't have to pay the kind of corrupt graft and bribery that has destroyed so many African societies in the post-colonial period since the end of World War II. And to allow these people to connect directly with consumers around the world and bring about great new material prosperity for many African societies. But you note a very important problem in many of these African countries, and that's the population demographic direction. There aren't going to be enough new jobs, however prosperous these economies are, even if they're growing at clips of 6 to 8% a year, to accommodate the explosive population growth in many of these countries, which will have the fastest population growth of any countries, any region around the world, so that, as you know, General, the uh, population of the African continent is expected to double from about 1 billion today to about 2 billion in 25 years. Well, if only 50 million of those people, as you know, see that there's great economic opportunity a few thousand miles to the north, great economic opportunity, and don't forget, freedom, which they don't have. They, have, they, have, they live in terror, they live in poverty, and they live in fear of governments, of corrupt governments in many African countries. They're going to head to Europe, and those pipelines are already in place for human traffickers, and it's one of the reasons why the Libya situation is so important for, for Europe, for Greece and for Europe. It has to be solved in a way that does not allow for this open sieve of migrants to continue to pour into Greece, to Italy, to France and to Spain, and to overwhelm the ability of European societies to deal with this massive uncontrolled influx of migrants. So this is going to be one of the most strategic issues for Europe in the years to come. So we don't face in the United States, General, I would say, a strategic threat from African countries to the United States, we're very much concerned about our European allies and the ability to maintain middle-class prosperous societies that are part of a larger Western or uni universal value system and uh, don't move in a direction that is overly influenced by migrant populations that really have very little connection or understanding of the Western values that have given us our tremendous quality of life and peace and prosperity in Europe, in the United States, and the global West. I will note that we are also working very closely with our French allies, who really have taken the lead in sending military forces into countries such as Mali and Niger, and into these vacuums, these ungoverned chaotic areas in the Saharan Desert, to help deal with uh, radical Islamist terror groups, especially Islamic State. Now that they've been successfully uprooted from Syria and Iraq, they're implanted anew in Africa and also to work with many of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa to adopt Western models of development and of infrastructure construction because so many of them have become utterly dependent on Chinese investment, Chinese loans, that as we saw in Sri Lanka, as we see in Zambia, as we see in other countries, these countries become very dependent on China, on Chinese Communist Party dictates, and eventually being forced to potentially surrender sovereign assets to Chinese enterprises because they can't repay these very onerous opaque terms in order to receive Chinese credit from two, five, and 10 years ago under the Belt Road Initiative. So the United States, Europe, and our free Asian allies all have a lot of work to do to help these African countries prosper. But I would say, General, the largest burden really is on Europe because if Africa moves in the wrong direction, Europe will suffer far more than the United States or our free allies in Asia. So now uh, I'm going to, let's say, to go to more uh, national issues, I mean, uh, Greek and uh, uh, Cyprus issues. Mm -hmm. In 2019, the new United States uh, uh, Greece uh, defense agreement uh, has been signed, with, that was expanded to somehow. And uh, there is a term there that the United States will uh, somehow uh, ensure the security of Greece. 
And uh, there, there are many who have criticized that when you say security, what do you mean? So is uh, the United States going to support Greece in case of a conflict with Turkey in uh, Aegean in or Mediterranean uh, related with the energy, of course? And uh, then in the second part of my question is, uh, how do you see the uh, uh, Republic of Cyprus and the United States uh, relationship the last uh, uh, two, three, five years anyway? Uh, we saw movements, we saw developments, and uh, even uh, the day before, uh, we said, let's say, they, they, they put the foundation for the, uh, for the Cyclops, the Cyprus Center for Land, uh, Open Seas, and the security and Port Security Training Center in Cyprus. So these are, uh, for me, are things that we could not imagine some years ago, but um, uh, here we are. Uh, how you, do you see this uh, United States Greece defense agreement, defense and security agreement? I think we're moving in a very, very strong and positive and more robust direction in the last several years. And I think the U.S. Greece defense cooperation agreement is really a hallmark of the fact that we now enjoy probably the best relations bilaterally between Washington and Athens in decades. And that's good news for the United States and it's good, good news for Greece. And I'm so glad you asked the question, General, because it's very important for those of us in the United States who follow developments in geopolitics in Southern Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean to remind our friends, our colleagues, and very frankly, sometimes even our, our relatives in Greece and, and in some cases in Cyprus, that the NATO alliance means that the United States and Greece are legally obligated to defend one another in the event of an external attack on either country. And Greece, of course, with every other NATO country, signed on to the Article 5 uh, treaty obligation uh, article after the September 11th terror let, attack by Al-Qaeda. Yeah, let me interrupt you. Uh, excuse me for that. But, you know, there is no provision when it happens between two NATO members. I know. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. Trust me. It's a very, very difficult issue. But uh, first and foremost, the United States and Greece are legally obligated to defend one another in the event of an attack. But as you correctly know, General, there is no provision in the NATO alliance for an intra-NATO conflict, which of course was unthinkable in 1949 when the yeah. NATO alliance came together. And then even three years later, when Greece and Turkey joined the NATO alliance together to protect Western Europe against the Soviet Union and against communism. So we have a very difficult situation now where we have the potential for a conflict between Greece and Turkey. But let's also let's look at the facts and let's look at history here, General. Greece and Turkey have not been at war in 100 years, right, since the Greek-Turkish War of, the, of 1919 to 1922. They almost went to war in 1974 over Cyprus. They could have gone to war over energy exploration in 1977, I believe it was, I believe again in 1987, and as I mentioned earlier, the 1996 emia Karda crisis. And of course, we had the very, very difficult situation in the summer of 2020. But in the end, both countries have recognized that it's not in their interest to go to war. And I think even where you had a more aggressive policy in Ankara, and I recall in 1996, because I was in regular consultation with the Clinton White House, and the National Security Council at the time of the EMEA Karda crisis, that there was great concern that then Prime Minister Tansu Chiler wanted to attack the Greek forces around EMEA. And it was the Turkish military, then run by Kemalists, not the Erdogan Islamists that are running the military now, that said to Prime Minister Chiler, we can't do that because then we have no protection from the United States and other NATO countries if we attack Greece. Now, that's not necessarily a legal argument, but it could have been a very wise political argument that nobody would have come to Turkey's defense if they had openly attacked Greece first. So in many ways, the NATO alliance between not only Greece and the United States, but Greece, Turkey and the United States has prevented war between Greece and Turkey in 1974 over Cyprus, which is not a member of NATO. And that was a great mistake of Cyprus in the 1960s when they had the opportunity to join NATO and they turned it down. And then, of course, in 1996, and even now. And I, I want to believe that cooler heads will always prevail in Ankara, but there's no guarantee of that, General. So you're right. We have very, very strong reasons to be concerned that something could go terribly wrong uh, between Greece and Turkey. But the United States is absolutely committed to Greece's security to the greatest degree possible. 
But in the event of an intra-NATO crisis, I think you could have the collapse of the entire NATO alliance because of such a conflict, not just a matter of U.S.-Greece security. So, so yes, sir. Yeah. So with, uh, with your permission, I would like to give you some uh, rest and uh, to go to our second part. And we have some questions for you already uh, been uh, said by, by our viewers. And uh, uh, Miltos, time for you. International law. We believe that since we have the international law in place, everything is solved. We don't have to worry about. It. Is that true? Your microphone. True. Uh, I believe that this is uh, the metaphysics uh, of uh, Greek public or generally speaking about uh, people. This is a general idea about uh, what people believe concerning international law. They believe that uh, it is something, some kind of magic that uh, resolves disputes and always uh, provides for a, for a solution that it is uh, uh, closer to what they believe that it is a just solution. Everybody believes that uh, has uh, the right and everybody believes and interprets international law in such a way so as uh, to claim justice over the other party, over the other disputant. The thing is that, and we shall start with this, uh, we have a, a distorted view about what international law is. And the very simple definition is about um, a set of rules that are agreed and accepted by the states, either by their state practice or by international agreements that govern their relations. And in a way, we have to accept that uh, it is fundamental to build this set of rules exactly because this is the only way to build a society, a society of states, just like the way that people, humans, individuals, uh, build their own societies, uh, just like societies, human societies uh, have been uh, created and they are based upon a supreme law. Usually, this is a constitution. Only in the case of international law, uh, we don't have this kind of a supreme law. We don't have this kind of a centralized system that it is owned to the very existence of the state. Uh, the system, the international system is decentralized and international law, the rules of international law are applied uh, within this decentralized international environment. And exactly because there is no central power, all states are to be considered equal. So there is uh, equality between states. All states are sovereign. Um, there is no state on a higher level compared to another uh, state. And this is good because if we had something like this, that would have been uh, the case of the global hegemony. Uh, so uh, we cannot exactly compare on the same ground uh, international law and domestic constitutional law, for example. There is no distinction of powers. We have distinction of powers within uh, a state, and uh, this is how checks and balances uh, function. Uh, but in the case of international law, uh, we do not possess this kind of uh, powers. The General Assembly is not a parliament. Uh, the Security Council of the United Nations is not the executive. The International Court of Justice is not a judiciary. They function like this, but they do not possess this kind of sovereign power that uh, states uh, and institutional authorities within the states uh, possess. As I usually say to my uh, students, the first year students, in order to explain the function of international law, uh, if we remember what uh, Thomas Hobbes said about the creation of a commonwealth, the state apparatus, in order to prevent the prevalence of uh, uh, the law of the jungle, uh, he created, he imagined the Leviathan. And the, the Leviathan was a solution uh, to anarchy, was a solution to the uh, misery uh, of uh, the life of that time in England, because England was uh, in a civil war in that time when uh, Thomas Hobbes conceived the idea of the Leviathan. And the Leviathan uh, is a biblical um, uh, beast with uh, supreme power. Uh, that was a kind of metaphor that Thomas Hobbes uh, used in order to show that if we want to achieve um, order, if we want to achieve safety, and if we want to uh, enjoy our liberties and rights, then we have to entrust someone else, uh, the sovereign, 
um, an institutional apparatus that will be governed by one person, some persons, or the people uh, in such a way so as to uh, take care of these basic needs and prevent um, civil war, uh, prevent anarchy, and so on. Now, Leviathan uh, has this kind of role within uh, a state. Uh, if you want to put this metaphor uh, in uh, the case of international law, in the case of the international environment, we have to find out that we have something like 193 Leviathans within the United Nations because we have 193 states that are sovereign states. They are legally equal, but at the same time, we all know that they don't have the same capabilities. So we have equals, legally equals, sovereign states within the international environment, and they use international law in order to resolve their disputes, in order to govern their relations. But at the same time, these relations are governed and resolved many times through the actual capabilities of the states. And in this case, states are not equals because different states have different capabilities. And of course, this is all about uh, power sharing and uh, the way states apply their power in their relations in order to resolve their disputes. Now, so, so in that case, can we say that uh, the stronger, uh, let's say, put his own will on the table? And um, in addition to that, uh, uh, I, I, I agree with this is the scientific, let's say, approach, but uh, scientific approach. But, uh, you know, we, we hear every day what the international says or uh, what the provision of international, let's say, say for the energy, for the economic exclusive zone, for the uh, continental shelf, for whatever, let's say, issue comes in any uh, uh, bilateral relation or international affairs. And uh, if, if this uh, international organization cannot implement or cannot impose all these decisions, all these, let's say, uh, uh, regulations that have been in place, what's for? Well, uh, I can, the easiest thing that I can do is uh, the classic um, tactics of uh, a legal scholar or a lawyer to reverse the argument. And uh, I could ask, for example, what could have we possibly do uh, if we didn't have uh, international organizations, if we didn't have this set of uh, rules that govern the uh, affairs between states? Uh, but I have to provide for a straightforward answer, and I know this. Uh, so uh, one thing is that we should not uh, overestimate uh, the capabilities of international organizations. International organizations are created by states and what they serve is exactly uh, a community of interests that uh, put states together. States want to coordinate their policies. They want to sit uh, on the same table and discuss, find solutions or even cooperate and coordinate their policies mm -hmm. in order to achieve goals. Now, you can do it faster, you can do it uh, uh, with uh, better results if you function within an international institution, if you can do it, it in a principled way, uh, within a multilateral, uh, let us say, uh, orientation, rather than achieve your goals uh, all by yourself, uh, achieve your goals on a unilateral uh, track. So international organizations, exactly, whether they are uh, global or whether they are regional, they do serve this building up of uh, um, uh, communities of interests. Uh, states are putting together uh, their interests and they build slowly sometimes or even fast sometimes uh, the impact of international organizations. So international organizations are not functioning all by themselves, uh, independent from the will of the states. Legally, they do function uh, in an independent way, but practically, and uh, whenever we have to talk about the policies and the decisions that are made within uh, international organizations, we have to admit that it is the stronger states, it is a state with uh, uh, the larger impact uh, that actually uh, help or uh, promote uh, their uh, interests or their goals within uh, these organizations. So, in a way, we can say that uh, it is on the benefit, it is in the interest of uh, powerful states to uh, achieve their goals within international organizations, international institutions, because in this way they legalize uh, their own interests. Whereas in the other uh, 
uh, hand, when we talk about uh, weaker states, uh, it is for them as well a better uh, choice to uh, put their interests on the table of an international institution and discuss these interests and try to put them side by side to the interests of another powerful country because you are going to get more benefits in this way rather than uh, remaining isolated outside an institutional framework. So in this way, uh, we can find that uh, we have to blame for many things United, States, United Nations, but United Nations is a global organization that, I have to repeat it, involves 193 Leviathans. And this is a mission impossible, in my opinion. From the other point of view, we have the European Union, for example. And the European Union is a unique, let us say, um, institutional engineering that involves integration. That means the transfer of state sovereignty to Brussels. Now, this is something that it is... Uh, original. Uh, it is uh, an experiment, a political experiment, and it goes well so far. Of course, there are problems. And when we have to make criticism concerning these kind of problems, we have to take into consideration that uh, even the European Union does not possess a magic stick, uh, does not possess these magic solutions in order to resolve disputes between member states or disputes between member states and other third countries. Yeah, so uh, uh, we see in the international law, in the international international arena, that there are laws that are not accepted by all countries. Like it happens with uh, the law of sea, UNCLOS, uh, and um, uh, the Modeco Bay, let's say, agreement that uh, Turkey has not accepted or has not signed this agreement. How, how, let's say, how much obliged Turkey is to follow that law? If tomorrow, for example, we can uh, uh, sign an agreement, Greece and Turkey, and go uh, in front of the International Court of Justice in Hague in order to resolve our dispute about the delimitation of the continental self, uh, we will find out uh, how much uh, Turkey uh, balances international law or its own power in order to impose its own interests against Greece. What I'm saying is that um, when it comes to um, issues concerning uh, the law of the sea, uh, Turkey is trying to project its own um, interpretation uh, about rules that are not interpreted the way that the Turkeys are trying to project. Uh, they have their own way. They have not signed, of course, uh, UNCLOS, uh, so they are not... Uh, uh, they are not obliged. They don't bear any kind of a legal obligation in order to follow. Uh, the law of the sea, but in any case, they are obliged to follow uh, the customary law of the sea and to uh, a large extent, the largest extent of the Modego Bay uh, uh, Treaty is about customary international law uh, regarding the law of the sea, uh, especially um, rules like uh, Article 121 concerning uh, the rights of islands, the fact that islands possess uh, fully the rights uh, concerning um, zone. territorial sea, continental self, and exclusive economic zone, uh, it is important. And it is important exactly because uh, it's not only the majority, but it is also um, uh, decisions, judgments by the International Court of Justice and the International uh, Court for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg. Uh, they have uh, continuously uh, decided uh, in cases that are at the interest, that are for uh, the Greek interpretation of this article and not only uh, for this article. So, in any case, uh, I understand that we have considerations, security considerations, uh, because we face uh, challenge, we, we face provocations from the other part of the Aegean, uh, but in this case, uh, exactly because we don't have to uh, uh, to uh, accept the challenge and engage ourselves in a, a kind of uh, um, a hot, let us say, episode uh, in the Aegean. Uh, this is why we should try uh, to uh, use our legal argumentation against uh, Turkey in order to win not only the impression within our own country, but in order to turn other countries closer 
to our interests and support us, whether they are members of the same international organizations where we participate or not. Uh, it doesn't matter. The thing is that we have to use uh, in an efficient way, in an effective way, um, uh, public diplomacy. Uh, public diplomacy is uh, of a critical importance in order to uh, project our uh, arguments and projecting effectively our arguments means that we can win at least the impression or uh, at least uh, the public opinion uh, when it comes to uh, the issues uh, that uh, form uh, the disputes between Greece and uh, Turkey. And this is something that it is very well played by the Turkish side. Uh, if, for example, you check uh, the way that the Turkish diplomacy and Turkish public diplomacy reacted during uh, February and March when Turkey actually instrumentalized uh, the uh, mixed migration flows in the Greek Turkish uh, frontiers, you will find out that uh, whether it had uh, to do with uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or uh, with uh, officials in uh, international organizations and especially the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and NATO, you will find out that uh, diplomats of these organizations were heavily uh, influenced by, by Turkish public diplomacy, uh, which of course it was, uh, uh, let us say, uh, the product of uh, fake news and disinformation. So in a way, participating in uh, an international organization is important uh, for the promotion of your own national interests. But uh, this promotion doesn't come alone by the participation. You have to be active, you have to take initiatives, and you have to be uh, proactive, I would rather say, and do oh, not yeah. just sit on the corner and expect uh, the other part uh, to attack. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that, now you, you, you touched the very sensitive point. We have to be, have to be proactive. proactive. It is something that... Uh, is, that does not characterize us, I mean, as Greeks, and uh, we try to, to solve uh, the issues, let's say, afterwards. So, uh, thank, thank you very much. So it is uh, then uh, to well, understand. Allow me a, com a, allow me a comment. Since yeah. you uh, raised the issue, uh, also raised the issue uh, of being proactive. Um, and uh, John also uh, commented upon uh, the Turkish Libyan memorandum about uh, the delimitation of the exclusive economic zone between Greece, between Turkey and uh, Libya. Uh, this event actually was uh, the reason, or it was, let us say, uh, the cause, the deeper cause for the uh, activation, for the inactivation of the Greek diplomacy. Uh, it is unbelievable what the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs has done. Uh, ever since, we see that uh, it was energized, it uh, actually uh, provided uh, for uh, a lot more resources and uh, effort in order uh, to uh, annul uh, this uh, agreement between Turkey and uh, Libya. Uh, but this is only because we uh, didn't see it coming or even if we did uh, if, even if we saw it uh, coming, we didn't act uh, in a proactive way. Uh, we didn't, uh, we weren't proactive, but still we were responsive. And this is how we saw uh, other agreements uh, with Italy, uh, with Egypt, that put on the table the issue of delimitation in the way that we believe that we should do delimitation with the kind of the rules that are, are accepted generally, not only by Greece, but with the majority of states and international courts. And this is how we should use international law. If we go, uh, if we move and we uh, actually agree on the table with other states uh, without, uh, you know, uh, without uh, losing um, our basic principles and our basic interests, uh, then this is how international law becomes a weapon. This is how we weaponize our policies without actually uh, using force. And this is how you make uh, the other uh, other countries, opponents, uh, adversaries, uh, life harder rather than uh, accepting their, uh, their challenges and being on the uh, spot always, uh, trying to be vigilant uh, in order to be responsive. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, what we saw the last, let's say, the whole last year 
we saw Turkish uh, Turkish activities taking place in uh, uh, southeastern Mediterranean in the economic exclusive zone of Cyprus, which has been declared and agreed with the neighboring countries, and also in um, in the continental shelf of Greece. Uh, since uh, we have not, let's say, declared our economic exclusive zone, uh, was or were these actions an illegal, illegally, let's say, taking place? Are they illegal? And uh, how we can, let's say, proceed with that uh, through the international law? Probably this is the easiest thing that you have asked me so far because there is no doubt that uh, uh, these are illegal acts. Uh, first of all, um, uh, Cyprus has already. Uh, declared an exclusive economic zone. So uh, the fact that uh, uh, Turkey is drilling in uh, Cyprus exclusive economic zo zone uh, is taking place, uh, this is uh, a straightforward violation of uh, the rights of the sovereign rights of uh, the Cyprus, the Cypriot democracy, uh, the Cypriot Republic. Uh, the thing is that Turkey does it uh, and will continue to behave like this. Uh, exactly because this issue is closely related to the solution of the Cypriot problem. And uh, this is a way to uh, press uh, the Cypriot, the Greek Cypriot uh, side, in order to accept uh, kind of solutions that are most likely uh, of the preference of Turkey, uh, rather than of the preference of both communities uh, in uh, Cyprus. Uh, a big communal, uh, bizonal, and uh, co community uh, solution with one state, with one legal personality, with one nationality, uh, should be the basis of uh, uh, the solution in uh, Cyprus. Instead, Turkey, along with uh, uh, the new uh, puppet government in uh, the northern part of uh, Cyprus, uh, they believe that uh, they should uh, uh, split everything, uh, even resources, and uh, pushing on uh, the grounds of uh, resources is a way to promote the kind of uh, the successionist uh, solution that uh, Ankara uh, actually favors. Uh, and this is why I believe that uh, in spring, uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, a polarized, uh, let us say, political uh, uh, scene, environment uh, in Cyprus. Uh, same thing uh, with uh, with Greece and Turkey, the Greek-Turkish uh, relations. I believe that uh, Turkey is going to do exactly what they have already programmed. They are going to bring uh, a drill uh, in order uh, to uh, to do the the rest of the job that Oruç race has done so far. Exploration is one thing; the other thing is drilling. So uh, they have done, they have completed, they have concluded with exploration. And next thing that they are going to do uh, is uh, they are going to drill uh, in the south of uh, Castellorizo or southeast of uh, Crete. Exactly because they need to show and create an etat etabli, a fait etabli, uh, in, uh, uh, in showing that we are holding that uh, islands do not possess exclusive economic zone. They do not possess a uh, continental self. Uh, that's why uh, we are drilling next to Castellorizo. That's why we are drilling next to Crete, uh, because we believe that uh, this is our exclusive economic zone and we and uh, our uh, coast is right opposite the coast of uh, Libya. Now, of course, this is kind of a position that it is more policy and a very reforming policy rather than the legally accepted uh, side of the story. Uh, yeah. And uh, international law provides the argumentation, but at the same time, we need the tools in order to project uh, our arguments uh, in an effective way. And these tools means that we possess uh, power capabilities that will discourage Turkey from attempting to drill uh, right next to Castellorizo or right next to uh, Crete. So, uh, one, uh, let's say one two-part question. Uh, that is that does it mean does it mean that we should be in a hurry to expand our territorial waters or even to declare our economic exclusive zone, if possible, tomorrow morning? 
No, I wouldn't say that it is the right time to expand our territorial waters now in the Aegean, because everybody, and especially within the European Union, uh, these uh, who are more protective uh, towards Turkey are going to accuse Greece uh, for uh, uh, putting out fire with gasoline, uh, because we are uh, expected to um, participate in explanatory uh, in exploratory uh, talks with uh, Turkey. Uh, that means that we are going to um, uh, to follow a kind of a policy that will be a quiet one with no provocations. And if we're going to expand our territorial waters in the Aegean right now, then Chancellor Merkel or Rome or Madrid uh, or somebody else is going to uh, point at Greece and say, come on, we are trying to... Um, resolve a dispute here and you are acting in a way that you are going to make it worse. Uh, so my opinion is that we should not proceed with uh, uh, the expansion of the territorial sea in the Aegean. We should keep it uh, in the Ionian uh, Sea. Uh, we can uh, uh, keep it uh, in the case of uh, um, Crete, for example, uh, or continental uh, coasts, but avoid expanded uh, in the islands uh, just because uh, that will be destructive uh, for our diplomatic efforts uh, that involve others, not Turkey, that involve others who are partners. Some of them are good partners, some are not. But in any case, uh, we should not, let us say, uh, provide uh, for an excuse uh, either for Germany or anybody else to justify uh, Erdogan's policy. Yeah, but uh, this one doesn't affect uh, the how to say the declaration of the economic exclusive zone. We can do it. We can do that uh, with uh, let's say uh, territorial waters in six miles. I mean, with Cyprus, for instance. Yeah, uh, the thing is that if we're going to declare an exclusive economic zone with Cyprus if we're going to reach an agreement with Cyprus, uh, that will involve Turkey. Uh, exactly in the way that uh, we didn't actually finalize a total agreement about the limitation of the exclusive economic zone with Egypt. We did a partial delimitation that didn't touch to uh, the waters that are uh, disputed by Turkey. So if we're going to do it with Cyprus, um, Turkey is going to react. I am not contrary to this... Uh, um, uh, prospect. I mean, uh, we are an independent state, we are a sovereign state, they are a sovereign state, uh, we can make a delimitation. If Turkey has objections, then we can put this issue on the table, and if we cannot negotiate effectively, then we can uh, bring it in front of the International Court of Justice. And I have full uh, uh, trust that the International Court of Justice is going to provide for a kind of uh, judgment that it will be closer to the Greek uh, interests rather than to the Turkish uh, interests. I'm not saying that we're going to get everything, but there is no doubt that we are going to get most of what we believe that it is ours. Yeah, ours. So I see. I see some comments uh, here, and uh, um, let's say some of you, many viewers are congratulating both of you for your uh, for your uh, uh, let's say views. And but there is one, and uh, this is a provocative question. Someone asks why Erdogan talks loudly, but uh, he is very careful about actually launching a war. And it starts with why. <laughs> John? Well, if we're talking about Greece, I think it's for the reasons that we discussed just a short while ago, that if Turkey were to launch uh, an offensive war against Greece, uh, it likely would face a tremendous blowback from the United States, from every European country, and you could have a rupturing of the NATO alliance, and then you could have Turkey very much exposed to a unified Western response. So Turkey is going to do, I believe, the best that it can. As I mentioned before with the example of Prime Minister Tansu Çiller in 1996, she wanted to attack the Greek Navy near EMEA, and it was the generals who said, you can't do that because we can't attack Greece first. And so I think to the degree that it involves Greece, it's because Greece is in the NATO alliance and it provides that protection against Turkey. Um, it, it has been almost completely 100 percent 
uh, fail safe uh, for the last 70 years that Greece has been in the NATO alliance. It doesn't mean it's going to last forever. And it doesn't mean that Erdogan can't commit an irrational act like Miltos is alluding to possibly in 2021, as I mentioned earlier, because his popularity is sinking and he's going to take a great risk to try and build up his base of support from 30 to 50 percent. But it, it's very difficult, very non-credible to see a logical, rational Turkish military approach to launching an offensive attack against Greece. But having said that, I want to go back to a hypothetical that Miltos laid out. And generally speaking, I hate to talk about hypotheticals because they're imaginary and completely abstract in the very real and brutal world of geopolitics. But I have heard the call for Greece to potentially uh, proceed with establishing and declaring its exclusive economic zone further out along with Egypt to complete that and all the way to Cyprus. And Greece probably has every international legal right to do so. But having the right to do something doesn't make it the responsible thing to do at that time and place. And so I would imagine that Prime Minister Mitsotakis in a circle is advising him that if he were to proceed in that direction, he would need to be ready with a military response to probably a very large Turkish naval armada coming into whatever part of this exclusive economic zone then allows for Greek contracted ships to conduct exploration and deal with the Turkish Navy harassing them. And then the question is, is Greece going to send its Navy to push back the Turkish Navy in what Greece considers to be its exclusive economic zone, where Turkey considers to be its exclusive economic zone? And then you have the potential for a tinderbox in a military conflict over natural gas exploration. It's an extraordinarily high risk proposition. And that's why I think what the prime minister has done to date with expanding territorial waters in the Ionian Sea and in the Sea of Crete, but leaving the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean alone for now. It doesn't mean it's a permanent hiatus, but just for now to better gauge when might be the right time to do so, either as a result of international arbitration on the continental shelf, bilateral negotiations with Turkey, or frankly, a new leader in Turkey post Erdogan, which is going to happen one day. Yeah, I... I have the opinion that um, uh, the expansion of the territorial water should happen the day after that we, uh, let's say, that the UNCLOS uh, came in, uh, in, in, in place, in force. But uh, there is another comment here that uh, this policy that was followed the last decades after 1994, when the law of sea was, let's say, uh, endorsed and agreed by 60 countries, I think, and uh, after the 60 countries uh, was uh, implemented, uh, this policy led us to the position that we are today. And in addition to that, uh, we gave time to, 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 the, to the National Assembly of Turkey to, to declare this uh, casus belli, mm -hmm. which, let's say, uh, we should act, we should be, again, we are coming to the same point, to be proactive. And uh, as soon as we started, let's say, the process to validate uh, the agreement in uh, the Greek parliament, we should declare the expansion of our territorial waters in 1994, if I'm not, if I, if I remember well. So uh, then, um, let's say I'm, I'm leaving all these issues and I'm coming to another issue, let's say, which uh, uh, affected uh, 2020 a lot. And uh, I have a question for both of you. Uh, is the pandemic's COVID-19 a national security issue? John? I think you really have to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, from a global perspective, yes, it's very much a national security issue because I think the evidence is increasingly clear that the Chinese Communist Party at the end of 2019 either was so grossly incompetent in managing a local epidemic and not being able to contain it, or they deliberately unleashed it on the world to prevent the Chinese economy from being the only one to have to suffer as a result of COVID. And so it's caused enormous economic devastation. It's increased poverty around the world. It has set back economies two, three years. And in many ways, one might augur, one might say that this augurs the Chinese Communist Party design on how they intend to operate in the international arena. They violated all of their obligations to the World Health Organization. They deliberately lied to the United Nations and to what one might call the international community, if such a thing actually exists, 
with information that they withheld or deliberately misconstrued in announcing it to the, to the world. So I think in many ways, China's actions, the actions of the Chinese Communist Party, I mean, we've known for years now that the Chinese Communist Party itself poses a strategic security threat to the well-being of the global West and probably to the liberal rules-based international order. Look at the South China Sea. I mean, I don't mean to digress too much, General, here uh, from the pandemic question, but in the South China Sea, to Miltos's point about how exclusive economic zones are to be delineated, how the UNCLOS is to be implemented, uh, China was sued by the Philippines in 2015 or 2016. The international court ruled against China and China said, we don't care. We're ignoring the international court's ruling. So if you don't have an, an international enforcement mechanism, then I'm not sure how good international law is. And this becomes very problematic when you have countries that don't want to abide by international law. And this is the world that China has introduced us to. But on a different level, I think we'll have a better sense as to whether or not COVID has been a direct national security challenge to a number of countries in the post-COVID era when we have a chance to look back and see what has survived the ravages of this global pandemic. So, uh, and then back to uh, Milto, something on uh, this uh, issue? Uh, I'm sure that uh, COVID-19 uh, or generally speaking pandemics are going to be a major issue uh, concerning the agenda of uh, security considerations, uh, not only for the United States, but uh, for everybody. So I do believe uh, at least uh, uh, for the incoming administration in the United States that Joe Biden is going to put a lot of emphasis upon uh, pandemics. It will be uh, in his agenda about security considerations. I expect to see uh, this issue uh, high uh, on his agenda, because this is a way in order to differentiate himself uh, compared to uh, Trump administration. And this is a way uh, for uh, uh, making a change that will, uh, uh, let us say, uh, return the United States um, security considerations uh, back to the uh, doctrine of uh, Clinton and uh, Obama uh, administrations, which is more associated uh, to uh, the issue of engagement, uh, the principal engagement with other states, the use of diplomacy, multilateralism, and of course, the projection of uh, values, the projection of uh, lifestyle and uh, rules uh, within uh, international law, uh, through international law, and uh, through uh, policies that follow international standards. So. I do believe that Joe Biden is going to follow uh, this uh, course, uh, adopt uh, the issue of uh, the pandemic, uh, both for reasons that have to do with uh, homeland security, but also in order to show to the world that irresponsible governments like the Chinese, for example, Communist Party, uh, have uh, uh, unleashed hell uh, for the rest of the world and caused uh, all the economic, uh, let us say, uh, destruction that this pandemic has caused. So uh, we have to be proactive and I'm sure that um, uh, security uh, considerations will involve pandemics as well. So uh, one more question in the economic exclusive zone. There are many articles and many analysts and many uh, even some, uh, let's say, members of the government that say that uh, the dispute, the Greek-Turkish dispute in uh, concerning the economic exclusive zone is a European Union issue. Is it true or is it right to say? Who is the yeah, question? Uh, Miltos, Miltos. Okay, okay. Um, this issue is uh, for, first and foremost uh, a national issue. It is a Greek issue. It is about uh, Greek uh, sovereign rights. Uh, no doubt uh, the European Union, Brussels, do have an interest uh, in uh, the sovereign rights of all member states. Uh, so, uh, in a way, we can say that it is a European issue. But first of all, it is a Greek issue. It is not the European Union that is going to be present in front of the International Court of Justice if this um, uh, issue uh, is going to be brought in front of of uh, the International Court of Justice. It will be Greece and Turkey. The fact that uh, the European uh, 
uh, union uh, is bound by uh, the, uh, in the Convention on the Law of the Sea is another thing. Okay, it shows that uh, the European Union uh, has uh, a firm and steady and constant uh, support towards uh, this uh, pact of the oceans. This is how uh, we call it, the constitution of the oceans, because exactly it is very important. And uh, of course, uh, Brussels do have a lot of respect and uh, uh, a lot of interest uh, concerning this kind of rights, for example, the rights that states have in exclusive economic zone, fisheries, for example, and we can uh, understand it by the way that fisheries was a point of class uh, between the United Kingdom and Brussels during Brexit. Uh, it is an important issue. So, yes, first of all, it is about Athens, but mm -hmm. then again, it involves Brussels as well. Yeah. Can you give me a comment? General, yeah. may I just comment on that, if yes. I might? And I, I want to break this up into two parts. Uh, one, where it involves uh, Turkey's illegal, unlawful activities in Cyprus's territorial waters or exclusive economic zone. It would be akin to what Milton said about Greece. It would be a Cypriot national policy, a Cypriot national decision. But I'm sure Cyprus would look to the European Union for assistance because Again, Cyprus is not a member of the NATO alliance, and it's going to be a very different response from the U.S., probably one of very quiet diplomacy behind the scenes, asking the Turks to, to desist from these activities, but not much more engagement than that diplomatically. But if it's between Greece and Turkey, yes, again, these are national decisions, and I completely concur with Miltus's argument that these are decisions for Athens to make in Greece's own national interest. But I would presume that Greece would go to both the European Union and to NATO because there are military considerations involved when you have these kinds of violations of the other nation's sovereign rights. So I'm afraid that if we have a Greece-Turkey disagreement over exclusive economic zones that potentially plays out into military involvement, again, it won't be an issue for the US to solve unilaterally or to impose a solution. But remember, and, and I don't like to do this often, but I have to be historically accurate. In 1996, in the middle of the EMEA Kardak crisis, it was President Bill Clinton and his then Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Richard Holbrook, who persuaded Turkey to deconflict, to pull back its forces from the twin island across from EMEA and basically bring that crisis to an end at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. And unfortunately, Dick Holbrook came back to Washington and talked about how Europe slept. The United States helped protect Greece and Turkey from going into war. But if it is something like this, I would see a very important diplomatic role for the United States. But the European Union really has to begin to step up to the plate on behalf of its member nations. And I very much appreciate the indignation of Athens and Nicosia earlier in 2020, or in late 2020, when many European countries are more concerned about a resolution condemning the end of democracy in Belarus than protecting the sovereign rights of their own member nations. I mean, what's the point of relying on the European Union for security when the EU seems to be distracted more by Belarus than the sovereignty violations of its member countries? A major, yeah. major problem in Brussels. Yeah, there, there are, let's say, some, some others. And uh, I don't, I don't like to go in a pathetical, let's say, statement. But uh, uh, some people say, okay, let's say that uh, European Union tomorrow agrees that uh, this dispute is a European Union slash Turkish issue, and uh, some people are coming together and uh, discuss the issue and came out with a kind of statement or a kind of decision that it is not accepted by Greece. And then what happens? So exactly this is why exactly this is why we should not waive our sovereign rights to resolve this uh, issue, this dispute with uh, Turkey. Because uh, if a problem is ours and we just need the assistance of others to resolve it um, in a way that it is uh, more preferable for us, it is okay. If others are stakeholders as well and they have a say upon uh, the resolution of this uh, dispute, then it is not our problem only. It is uh, there is problem as well. So they're going to have a say 
on uh, the final resolution of the problem. So this is a matter of a choice that we have to make. And I do believe that uh, it should remain as an issue uh, to Athens and do not share this issue uh, with Brussels. Uh, yeah, but I would add on top of that, Miltos, if I might, and we referred earlier to the weaponization of the millions of Syrian migrants and refugees that are on Turkish territory today that uh, Erdogan began to weaponize again against Greece in early 2020, I believe it was uh, pre-COVID. And uh, can, he, can, he can open those human trafficking pipelines, turn the police away from those criminals, and allow 10,000 migrants to come into Greece every month for the next several years if he chooses to do so. So the degree to which Europe wants to make sure those migrants don't come into Europe, especially into Germany, Germany may sacrifice Greece's interests in order to protect Germany. And you may have other countries in Central and Eastern Europe voting against Greece to protect their own societies against Turkey's opening of the spigot of these migrants. So Greece has to make these decisions based on its own interests. If it relies on other countries to determine what is its, is its, uh, its own sovereign interests, it may find itself on the very, very losing end of that equation. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. But, you know, uh, what we see in place now, we see some uh, facts which are already given. I mean, uh, in the economic reclusive zone of Cyprus, we have seen drilling. Uh, there are, let's see, in two or three that uh, uh, and drill has been concluded anyway. We don't know whether or not, let's say, the deposits which were found are enough in order to exploit them. But the fact is there. And also, Turkey says that we, I have spent a lot of money in order to make the, I would say, the research. And um, I'm not going to agree with any other solution, rather what I believe that it is right for me. And uh, these are these are the announcements of the Turkish government. Uh, so uh, we are more or less one and a half hour in the air. But uh, uh, I, I have, let's say, one more uh, uh, to ask John. Uh, is it is it okay if I say that uh, from uh, January 20th, 12 o'clock at noon, everything changes in the world? No, not at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's an unwise way of looking at the way the world operates. The idea somehow that the United States dictates the world order is, is such a falsehood, it's such a misunderstanding of global geopolitics the Chinese have been implementing their planning strategies for years, if not decades, and they just announced their latest five-year plan last year. Russia will continue to do what it, it, it needs to do to advance its own interests in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Central Asia. They'll modulate their policies based on what they think a Biden administration might do in response. But it's not just these uh, adversarial powers or outright enemies general, uh, but even in countries such as Europe. I mean, Greece has its own national policies to proceed with on the domestic front, on the security front, whether it's in Turkey, whether it's in the Balkans, whether it's in the East Med, whether it's in Libya. They'll maybe calibrate their policies, modulate them somehow because they want to anticipate the closest partnership with the United States. But the world keeps turning on its axis, regardless of who's in power in Washington. And I would posit that, in fact, what we're going to see is more and more agency on the part of other countries, especially Beijing, but also Moscow inside the Middle East. I think Tehran is going to be a reanimated problem for the countries in that region, especially if they feel cocksure that the Biden administration will rejoin the nuclear agreement without any concessions from Tehran. And so I think uh, many things around the world will continue as they were on January 19th, will be largely the same on January 21st. And even the Biden administration will take some time. Remember, they have to get all of their appointments approved by the Senate. It'll take several months to get policies in place and to reconfigure our foreign policy and our military strategies. So this will be a transition that'll take most of 2021, but the world will continue to revolve regardless of who's president in the White House. Okay, but uh, can we say that uh, since uh, the new president of the United States is a politician, with a long experience in uh, both, uh, let's say, the, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate and eight years as a vice president that uh, he knows uh, uh, much better than the current president of the, the Greek or yeah. the Greek period. 
uh, and uh, Greek Turkish relations and uh, uh, Republic of Cyprus Turkish relations that are better than anyone else, let's say, that uh, the, of the United States administrations in the past. Could we expect something uh, not not to play with only with us, but can we expect someone who can be more objective, not keeping, let's mm -hmm. say, the same distances as as many other organizations do? All right, let me let me frame this, if I may, General, this way. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Senator Joe Biden and Vice President Joe Biden, over the course of nearly 50 years in public service, knows the U.S.-Greece relationship and the Cyprus issue probably coming into the presidency better than anyone in the last 50 years, we'll say. But remember also that Joe Biden has been surrounded by people who have been very close to Turkey over the decades. And with all the things that candidate Biden said about Erdogan being a thug and an autocrat and the like, first of all, the U.S. and Greece enjoy their best relations in decades under the Trump administration. The Trump administration signed off on the language that ended the arms embargo in Cyprus. And now we have direct mill-to-mill -mill diplomatic ties with a military attache in Nicosia and a Cypriot defense attache in Washington. So we have a much better relationship already under President Trump than we had under previous administrations. But I do want to warn everyone who's watching this about one thing. Probably the overriding Turkey policy of the Biden administration is not to find ways to push Turkey away, to isolate it, or to punish it for no particular reason, but to make sure that, that it's not under the Biden administration that the U.S. and the West loses Turkey. So I think you're going to see a very sort of full press engagement of Ankara, again, promoting Western values, promoting Western principles, promoting what we consider to be shared NATO objectives and trying to persuade Erdogan to stop doing what he's been doing that's been so troublesome for Turkey, for our allies, for Greece, for the Middle East, but to try to move Turkish foreign policy in a different direction. But there will be, I think, full court engagement of Turkey. And I don't think that's going to come at the expense of Greece and Cyprus. We can simply move both of those directions forward on parallel tracks. So, uh, Miltos, one more question for you as I see here in the comments. What is the, let's say, if if I can use that term, what is the best course of action uh, in uh, resolving or solving this uh, issue with, the, let's say, the greek Turkish issue concerning the economic exclusive zone or the continental self issue? Uh, the thing and is that... I, I, use, I use this military term course of action because you are aware of it. Uh, <laughs> John used to be our advisor in the NATO headquarters in Thessaloniki. And uh, so mm -hmm. he's familiar with the military operations too. No, um, the course of action uh, is something that should bother us. Why? Because uh, uh, we have all these uh, uh, talks that we have uh, re-engaged again with uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, we have to restart these uh, exploratory talks, talks with Turkey. For us, uh, it is uh, a way to put on the table uh, our arguments and our position about what is exactly the dispute or the disputes between uh, Turkey and Greece. Now, this is clear for us. It is all about uh, the, the delimitation of the continental self. And of course, in case we declare an exclusive economic zone, the delimitation of the exclusive economic zone, uh, period. For Turkey, this is not the case. Turkey believes that uh, it should uh, project these exploratory talks as something that it is more than a, a dialogue. It is a negotiation. And mm -hmm. this is a, a very clever tactic uh, by the Turkey side. Because once we accept that we negotiate, that means that we have an agenda. And that means that Turkey has been able to put on the table, on the agenda, whatever Turkey believes that there is a dispute with Greece that involves the delimitarization of Greek islands, it involves even sovereignty over Greek islands, and so on. So if we accept that it is a negotiation and it is not about an exploratory talk, which is meaningless, let us say, uh, in terms of essence, because what we are trying to do is is to agree about what our difference, our dispute is. So if we accept that it is a negotiation, then legally speaking, we admit that we should put on the agenda not only what we believe that it is a dispute between Greece and Turkey, but also what Turkey believes that it is a dispute between them and us. 
So this is something that should not be done. We should not proceed with a negotiation uh, with Ankara exactly because we are risking uh, to uh, put under dispute issues that we believe that it is all about our sovereign rights and they have been resolved years ago. But yeah, but having said that, do you see any, uh, any, how to say, any option, any case that the Turkey will agree to go to the hand cards for the uh, for this issue? No way. I don't believe that Turkey is going to agree uh, to uh, a compromise in order to uh, reach uh, the Hague Accord. Uh, it is uh, for the benefit of Turkey uh, to uh, press to put a lot of pressure upon Greece in order to negotiate, in order to find the solution Kazan Kazan. And one thing that we should also uh, be aware of is this uh, proposal that comes from uh, Charles Michel uh, from the European uh, Union about this conference between stakeholders in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, think about it. Uh, this is a proposal about uh, a roundtable that would involve uh, Egypt, Israel, uh, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus. I don't know who they mean by Cyprus, which side or whether it is only Cyprus, the independent state, Libya, and so on. I don't believe that all these uh, are going to sit on the same table and discuss. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing, assume that we reach to the table and all stakeholders participate. That will be exactly uh, for the benefit in favor of Turkey, because within this uh, multilateral forum, Turkey will be able to project uh, its own uh, reforming uh, challenges uh, in the region. And this is something that we should avoid. I mean, we cannot talk, we cannot participate in any, any kind of uh, dispute, dispute settlement um, uh, mechanism without rules. And Turkey uh, favors a no rules uh, dispute resolution mechanism, whatever this is, in order to promote its own uh, interests at the expense of the Greek interests. And Kazan Kazan, it is not actually uh, a win win solution because a win win solution is a way to resolve a dispute for the benefit of both parties without. Uh, having, let us say, uh, without bearing the feeling of being defeated. Now, if one or both parties feel that they are going to uh, defeat each other, this is not a win-win solution. And the Kazan-Kazan solution, it is uh, the kind of uh, solution that means that uh, ours is yours and uh, uh, yours is ours and ours is ours. Um, yeah. So, in a way, we should be aware in this course of action and uh, remain, uh, let us say, um, close to the policy that we have followed so far, plus take action like the way we did in with Italy and Egypt. Whether this is going to be with Albania or with uh, uh, Cyprus, in order to enhance our diplomatic position, this is another thing. But uh, we should uh, try this kind of proactive uh, diplomacy, uh, because in this way, we are going to uh, make feel uh, to, to, to uh, make Turkey feel uncomfortable uh, in our relationship, rather than uh, vice versa. Yeah, I, I, let me allow me to to make a comment on this. Uh, I think that we have to be very careful uh, on this uh, regional, let's say, meeting concerning the uh, the energy issue, anyway because uh, Turkey has already declared that uh, in this meeting uh, the occupied areas, uh, the Republic of Northern Cyprus, how they call it anyway, should participate equally. And of course, this is something that we, we are not going to accept. And this is what uh, Turkey is waiting for, uh, to say no, and then to blame again Greece, that Greece is not going to be discussed the issue. But John, I have, uh, let's say, two questions, well, let's say, for you and then to, to give you the, the floor in order to close the session. The first one says that uh, having in mind the, the, the last, let's say, announcement that uh, Iran is going to, uh, let's say, to deal with uranium 20% and uh, to increase this uh, capacity, etc., etc. Are we, let's say, in, uh, in a way to say that the nuclear weapons are more likely to be used in the next, let's say, 
or in the, the in the years to come? Well, again, we want to be very careful about speaking in hypotheticals, but what is clear is that other capitals in the Middle East and in Southern Europe, we'll talk about Turkey in a second, have stated that if Iran develops a nuclear weapons capability matched by a ballistic missile delivery capability, then Saudi Arabia intends to acquire that. And they may just purchase them off the shelf from Pakistan, for instance. And then if Saudi Arabia has nuclear weapons, then Egypt will not want to be uh, the, the second greatest military power in the Sunni Arab world, and they will acquire nuclear weapons on ballistic missiles. And Turkey, which is not Arabic, it's Turkic, but the broad Sunni community, uh, Turkey is going to say if Saudi Arabia has nuclear weapons and Egypt has nuclear weapons, we, the second largest power in NATO and a G20 country, must certainly also have nuclear weapons. So if we're talking about Iran, and Saudi Arabia, who are already sort of the major uh, competitors in the Islamic blood feud of Sunni versus Shia confessions, uh, have nuclear weapons, as does Egypt, as does Turkey. Let's just say from a statistical probability perspective, it increases the possibility that nuclear weapons would be used in the Middle East. And that's, I think, a scenario that almost every responsible leader in the world would like to avoid. Um, so, A, because we don't want to see that kind of uh, cascading nuclear proliferation in the Middle East and in the Eastern Mediterranean. And even if there's no proliferation, General, I would say that Iran, which is the world's leading in, uh, state sponsor of international terrorism and has provided all kinds of conventional armaments for its proxies in Syria, in Iraq, in Bahrain, in Yemen, in Hamas, um, with Hamas in Gaza, and to Hezbollah in Lebanon, and has attempted major assassinations of diplomats in Amsterdam, in Paris, and in Washington, D.C., all in the last 10 years, is one of the most dangerous countries in the world. So the nuclear proliferation argument aside, the worst thing that could happen in the Middle East and for any country within 2,000 miles of Iran is for the radical Islamist Shia mullahs to get their hands on nuclear weapons. It's something the world has to do a better job of working together to ensure not only is not delayed, and I think that was the great flaw in the Iran agreement, but never happens, period. Okay, so coming closer to close, uh, Miltos, the floor is yours. Hmm. Well, Final statement. What a statement. I will go back to uh, a question. Uh, why Erdogan talk loud but he's very careful about actually launching a war. Erdogan will never launch a war against Greece. Erdogan is talking loud exactly because he's playing the chicken game. Uh, he's trying to uh, convince Greece to give in to his own demands without resorting to uh, the use of armed force. That's one thing. Uh, another explanation is that uh, Erdogan understands that uh, he cannot go on a war against Greece because he will have to pay uh, a very uh, high cost uh, in this case. A third argument, which is closer to my interests, is the fact that Erdogan is talking loud, but at the same time, what he says loudly is not only provocation, but it is also argumentation. I mean, Erdogan is talking about... Uh, um, uh, the Blue Homeland, for example, or uh, about his uh, brothers in the Caucasus uh, region, uh, or about uh, other brothers in uh, the Balkans, uh, or in the Middle East. But at the same time, he is trying to be... Or in, China. Or or in China. China. Exactly. Uh, at the same time, he is trying to breed uh, his interests, uh, Turkey's, uh, interests in these regions with international law. He offers an interpretation of international law in order to justify uh, his interests. And this is the kind of the connection that I find between national security uh, and security interests with, with international law. And that's why I insist that it is important uh, for uh, Greek foreign policy, uh, for the Greek state, in order to launch this kind of of uh, legal argumentation against Turkey, against Albania, in order to discomfort these countries, in order to win the impressions, and in order to make them make a choice 
either to do what they actually threat to do, something that they are not going to do in the case of Turkey, uh, or um, finally sit down on the same table and work honorably with good faith upon a solution. John. My closing statement is a very simple one, General. Uh, we have entered what is perhaps the most complex and dangerous geopolitical landscape on the world stage in decades. And the great challenge is going to be how um, Greece, the European Union, NATO, the United States, and the free countries of Asia and other parts of the world are going to deal with the challenge that is posed by the Chinese Communist Party over the next 20 to 30 years. We are in a second Cold War, unfortunately, and this one may be more complex than the one that we faced uh, decades ago with the Soviet Union, because we're not just dealing with a militarily powerful China, but an extra extraordinarily wealthy one, and one that has no bounds on morality or ethics in dealing with countries around the world, including inside of Europe, which is why we're so troubled by this recently announced EU-China partnership. Having said that, I'm very, very confident that we will find ways to advance liberty and freedom and free market capitalist ideas in ways that continue to bring peace and prosperity to the people of Greece, its neighborhood, Europe, the free countries around the world, and hopefully one day those countries and societies that are victimized by tyrannical governments. That has to be our goal for the 21st century. But until then, well, more importantly, right now on January 5th, I want to wish you, General, and Miltos here and your team, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to work with you and to try to share some of our insights with your Greek and global audience. And again, to all of your audience members, best wishes for good health and great happiness in the new year and beyond. So let me then thank you both for being for joining me tonight. And uh, I hope that uh, we offer to our viewers uh, uh, enough knowledge and uh, too much experience of both of you. And uh, I'm sure that um, uh, whoever, let's say, attended us uh, gained something. Uh, with that, I wish you both Chronia Pola. Have a nice epiphany day for tomorrow and uh, 2021 to be a, pr a, a, a prosperous, healthy and a creative year. Thank you very much. And turning to Greeks, uh, ευχαριστώ όλους εσάς που μας παρακολουθήσατε απόψε με αυτή την ιδιαίτερη uh, εκπομπή στην αγγλική γλώσσα. Ελπίζω να μην σας κουράσαμε πολύ και φαντάζομαι, εκτιμώ ότι θα ήταν χρήσιμα όσα ακούσαμε από τους δύο ειδικού στον τομέα τους ο καθένας και συνεχίζουμε στην επόμενη φορά με ένα άλλο θέμα πάλι γύρω από την εθνική ασφάλεια στις 19 Ιανουαρίου, 24 ώρες σχεδόν πριν από την αλλαγή της διοίκησης των Ηνωμένων Πολιτιών. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ. Να έχετε μια ευχάριστη νύχτα και μια καλή μέρα αύριο των Επιφανίων με καλή φώτιση για όλους μας. Καλό βράδυ. Καλό φωτισμό σε όλους. Χρόνια πολλά.